Angela Heiken, and this is our performance called The Overthrow of the Hawaiian Monarchy. Life for the Hawaiian people changed during the 1800s when they encountered foreign missionaries and businessmen who exchanged and enforced ideas about religion, customs, and running the Hawaiian kingdom. A group of influential businessmen, known as the Annexation Club, devised a plan to overthrow the Hawaiian kingdom during Queen Lukumani's reign. I, the Leo Kamani became Queen of Hawaii in January 1891 after the death of my brother, King David Kalakau. I came to the throne when Hawaii was in the middle of an economic depression. The reciprocity treaty, reciprocity treaty once granted tax-free Hawaiian sugar to enter the United States in exchange for Pearl Harbor as a U.S. naval base. However, when the U.S. government imposed the McKinley Tariff Act in 1890, only U.S. sugar producers could export raw sugar without being taxed. I, Lauren Thurston, a lawyer, politician, and businessman, understood the impact of the McKinley Tariff Act on Hawaii. Since Hawaii was not a part of the United States, we no longer had tax-free Hawaiian benefits. We must fight for Hawaii's annexation to the United States. This is the only way Hawaii sugar industry can compete with other U.S. producers. You, a descendant of the early missionaries, think you are in a position to decide the fate of the Hawaiian kingdom? Yes, I'm a loyal, educated Hawaiian citizen. I only want what's best for Hawaii because native Hawaiians don't have the experience to run Hawaiian affairs. Lauren Thurston, leader of an annexation club, wants to gain prosperity and control of Hawaii. He wants Hawaii's annexation to the United States which will put power in the hands of foreigners. When my brother, King David Kalakaua, was forced to sign the Bayonet Constitution of 1887, he was stripped of his executive powers. He could no longer take official action without the approval of his cabinet members. My people have been urging me to write a new constitution to restore power and control back to the Hawaiian monarchy. I want to restore voting rights back to my Hawaiian people, which is taken away by the Bayonet Constitution. If you did not own land or wealth, you could not vote, and many Hawaiians lost their voting rights. When I heard the Queen wanted to write a new constitution, I secretly formed the Committee of Public Safety. We felt it was our duty to take control over Hawaii, rather than have an unreasonable ruler. However, when the Queen's advisor found out, he warned her. Ugh, I was so furious! My constitution could not be published because only two of my ministers had signed my constitution. When I asked for the crowd waiting outside Umani Palace that the constitution would be delayed, they were disappointed. I asked my people to return home peacefully. I immediately called a meeting with the Committee of Public Safety to maintain law and order. As chairman, I ordered that all arms be turned in and that Hawaii be ruled by martial law. I have planned to make an announcement that the constitution will not be changed. However, it was too late because the Committee of Public Safety had set up the provisional government that took power away from the monarchy. I asked United States Minister John Stevens to call upon American troops aboard the USS Boston, an American warship that was docked in Honolulu. I told Stevens that the troops were needed to protect American lives and property because of the unrest in the community. When my cabinet members saw armed US troops marching down the streets, they immediately met with Hawaii's governor, Archibald Clayhorn. Governor Clayhorn told U.S. Minister John Stevens that the landing of the troops was a violation of international law and that he will file a formal protest to the United States government. When the Queen took matters into her own hands, I sought help from Stevens. I feared bloodshed. Minister Stevens supported the annexation of the Hawaiian Kingdom to the United States. As a U.S. diplomat, he was to foster a trusting relationship with the Hawaiian government, but instead, he supported the annexationists. We asked former Marshal of the Kingdom, Mr. Sofer, to be Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. He refused to go along with the overthrow of the monarchy. He thought such a move would be unwise in the view of the treaty that pledged the United States and Great Britain to protect Hawaii's independence. Finally, Sofer agreed to take command of the Armed Forces when Sanford Dole agreed to head the new government. U.S. troops surrounded my palace, and I surrounded my throne at gunpoint to avoid the exchange of gunfire and bloodshed. Now, to avoid any collision of armed forces,
forces and perhaps loss of life. I do, under this protest and impelled by said forces, yield my authority until such time as the government of the United States shall, upon the facts presented to it, under the actions of its representatives, and being say me, in the authority which I claim as the constitutional sovereign of the Hawaiian Islands. I quickly formed a commission to go to Washington, D.C. to make a treaty of annexation with the United States. I also formed a commission to plead my case in Washington, but my representatives refused passage aboard the same ship that were taking the provisional government representatives. We had to wait months for another ship to arrive before we present our case. This gave a huge advantage to Lauren Thurston and his representatives. United States President Benjamin Harrison was in favor of annexation. He ordered that a treaty of annexation be presented with the U.S. Senate. President Benjamin Harrison lost the election to Grover Cleveland. When President Cleveland came into office, he withdrew the treaty of annexation. He had been influenced by my niece, Princess Kayulani, who went to Washington to present my case. President Cleveland appointed former chairman James Blount to investigate the matter. This is preposterous! There was a great deal of debate between the U.S. Senate about Hawaii and annexation. Now they are sending James Blount to investigate the events that led up to the overthrow? Don't they understand that we, the descendants of the missionaries, are the ones who built up Hawaii financially, agriculturally, and politically? Because of us, there's a civilized government in Hawaii. James Blount did a thorough investigation, and the Blount report stated that the overthrow was illegal. However, the U.S. Senate believed what John Stevens and Ida was right, which it was. But my supporters remained loyal. They devised a plot to take back the throne. They hid weapons everywhere. It was reported that weapons were found in the Queen's garden. The Queen and her supporters were arrested, and the Queen was fined $5,000 and five years hard labor. During my house arrest, I had to sign a document giving up claim of my throne to the Republic of Hawaii. But in exchange, my supporters were freed and I didn't have to pay the $5,000 or do five years of labor. I was alone, with no one to tell me what was going on outside. Every once in a while, someone would sneak up to me and give me a newspaper, but that didn't happen often. Even though I was frustrated, I forgave. I prayed to God. Behold not with malevolence, the sins of man, but forgive and bless. Hawaii finally became annexed to the United States during the month of April 1989, when the U.S. entered the Spanish-American War. Hawaii was an important naval base for the U.S. When William McKinley became president, he wrote an apology letter, but kept Hawaii as a U.S. territory. Hawaii eventually became the 50th state of America on August 21st, 1959. Lilia Galani was the last Hawaiian monarch. Queen Lilia was educated and explored the world. Unfortunately, she had sealed her fate when she exchanged the throne for peace and to avoid bloodshed when she encountered the Committee of Safety and their plan to annex Hawaii. She will always be known for her love of children, loyalty to Hawaiians, and songs she composed while in prison. Her most famous is Aloha Oi. Uh.